missing. Misfits and manhunts. This was a fun one to put together. We're going to cover the usual suspects, the people, people, the, the ones that people usually associate with the guy who really might be him. The anonymous mystery, the steps he took to protect his identity, early mining and network parenting, his mysterious disappearance, the hunt, false leads, and a possible finding. The fun creation story, but why it no longer matters. This is a picture I put together myself. See a little Photoshop in here? You guys see the movie, The Usual Suspects? Other than Kaiser Soze, these are all people that have claimed or have been suspected to be Satoshi Nakamoto. And we'll talk about all of them, except Satoshi, or except for Kaiser Soze. <laughs> so, this is one of the, the, the most fascinating chases. Uh, this is the Bigfoot, the Bigfoot, or the Loch Ness Monster of our generation, right? And so newspaper reporters all over the world, the TV coverage, uh, this has been the, the story that will make their career. And as one of them says, this is one of the great mysteries of the digital age. That's by Nathaniel Popper, who wrote a story, a book, actually, The Digital Gold, which really, I suggest, highly suggest reading it. It's a very good book. You'll find on, I'll get no money for this, but you'll find on Amazon.com. Uh, the GMX, this is the, the email account that uh, he signed up for when he's, when he did his communications and actually issued the Bitcoin white paper itself, it was Satoshi at uh, gmx.com. And so if you go to that website, you can see that there's no really requirement, identification needed. You give them your name and say you're going to sign up, and they kind of, all right, give them date of birth. We're not going to check on it or anything, but uh, at least that gives you an idea of how to stay anonymous. August 18th, 2008, the domain name for Bitcoin.org was registered. Today, at least, that domain name is protected uh, with a who is it guard, meaning the identity who registered is not public information. But somebody was preparing. The email account used was from the anonymous email account service and is untraceable. All the communication that went through the Tor network, Tor network was created by the US Navy so they could communicate with each other through the internet without being intercepted. It stands for the Onion Router. And a lot of people also refer that as the dark web. It's not really the dark web. It's how people communicate on the dark web. But it's not the dark web itself. And you can get, uh, there's browsers for it. You can get a, an, uh, on Firefox, there's a Tor uh, piece, an add-on that you can get. So you can be able to, I don't know what you call it, surf, but you can access websites that only show up on the Tor network. And you run it on your iPhone too? Oh, OK. Wow, to talk to you, you sound like an interesting person to talk to. Um, so I, I've looked at the Tor network a little bit, and, and it gets all the headlines, but you know, 99% of the Tor network is just unrecorded websites or you know, things that are connected to it that's not evil or you know, naughty or whatever. It's just this is not searched by web engine. So it's you know, to kind of lighten the load on that, it's not all bad stuff. And this talks about the Tor network a little bit. It goes through a, a relay where they hide the endpoint and the entry points, and it goes through. They just kind of combine a whole bunch of channels and, and signals together. Um, it's not as uh, innocent, or it's not. Uh, people think that it, they can remain super private on it, but uh, NSA, these people work on it all the time. So if you think you're going to get away with bad stuff on there, I wouldn't count on it because they have their ways. So the original Bitcoin transaction, we talked about this in the last one, it's called the Genesis block. And this is a website called blockchain.info. You can study all kinds of things about Bitcoin and the transactions and where it came from and where it went to. And you can see that he has 66, oh, wrong one. Oh, I really messed it up, man. <laughs> this is why we can't have good things. Let me fix this just one second. Okay, sorry about that. 
So we can look at this a little bit. You can see that these are donations. 66 coins received uh, since the first initial transaction. He mined 50 Bitcoins. You can see here at the very bottom, little green button. That was his initial transaction. So how did he get 66? And how did he get 1,066 transactions? This has now become sort of a wishing well. People thank you, Satoshi. He'll, he's never spent any of his Bitcoins ever. He supposedly owns a, around a million of them. He's never, ever spent one. And so people are, they send him just a little bit of Bitcoin throughout the years to say thank you. So a little bit of interest and trivia for you. It's estimated that he's mined about a million. He was, people have done research back at looking at the computer system and kind of can track the IP addresses and the amount of traffic and they do analysis on there. And they suspect that he was an academic of some sort because they look at the amount of processing. And, and it took Satoshi about five days to actually mine the second Bitcoin. The first one was sort of a trick. He kind of popped it into existence and then he put his machines to work trying to mine the second Bitcoin and it took him five days and they watched the amount of processing power add each day. So he had, they estimate he had maybe 100 computers at one point. So they thought, well, maybe he had a business or a school or maybe a back office at the NSA. <laughs> Who knows where it came from? But he slowly added to it. Um, and they suspect, they, they, being able to try, talk to the other people that were involved early, they were process elimination, start discounting the other people's and said, okay, well, nobody's claimed this. And so they estimate about a million, which today's money, that would be about $800 million. So some people, if predictions come true and Bitcoin could theoretically uh, be a neutral country, a world reserve country, theoretically, it's not unfounded. A lot of people with PhDs are a lot smarter than me that says if the right conditions meet, Bitcoin could be one day measured as a million dollars. And if Bitcoin is a million dollars one day, and Satoshi Nakamoto has got a million, Satoshi Nakamoto could be the world's first trillionaire. And when I typed that in Google, it didn't, wasn't even a word. <laughs> a trillionaire? No. It wouldn't, uh, maybe I spelled it wrong, but billionaire, billionaire was there. He tried to change that B to a TR. Uh, trillion, no one's even thought of a trillionaire, I guess. Yeah. And so you can see when, when I put that slide together, that was, you know, Bitcoin was at seven hundred dollars. It's eight, what, twenty today? I don't really track it that closely. Nobody knows who Satoshi is. He only communicated through email, and he went to great lengths to remain obscure. To not get our audience. What's your name? Bob. Bob, and I, it says it's extremely hard not to leave digital footprints now. And you're right, the guy must have been, oh, he must have known something about encryption and cryptography. And uh, so he used the Tor network, he used anonymous email, uh, and he was very careful when he talked to people. It was, I don't, I don't, he might have done some chatting, or, you know, sort of live chat, but uh, he never talked about anything personal. It was all right down to business, even when they were starting to try to joke with him a little bit. Uh, he gave very, very little indication of what time zone he was in. I think he, he mentioned it on, on uh, some report they had to fill out for something. He said he was a uh, Japanese male that was 2034 or something like that. But, you know, anytime anybody started to dig into it, they realized really quickly that that was all fake. And we talked about this a little bit in the last night. He actually put the headline in his, in the, in the Genesis block. And that's what this is on the left. If you've never seen hexadecimal, uh, that all the weird random letters and numbers there are uh, characters in the alphabet. That if you uh, transpose those in their, their software out there, if you Google it, uh, hexadecimal to English or whatever, it'll, it'll translate that for you. The Sotoshi Enigma. We talked about this. A journalist has spent years looking for Nakamoto. His identity was been one of the great mysteries of the internet and the holy grail of investigative reporting. Let me know what this is. Have you seen that before? The cryptex. Those are kind of fun. Path of, they were invented hundreds of years ago. The royalty of the time would put messages in there to be able to give to each other. And you have to spin these in the right uh, order. Each of these dials have a letter of the alphabet, and so they could put their 
whatever the key word is. That's the, that's the whole key to the whole situation. That was a key that you had to know. It's the secret key to be able to see that message. New York's Josh, Joshua Davis says, the need to find him seemed almost painful. Nakamoto himself is a cipher. And here I go ahead and uncover in case you weren't here the last the last part, the, the newspaper that has the clipping and that is now a collector's item. Did you find one? Let me know. I'll buy it from you. If you can find an actual paper copy of it. So let's talk about a little bit of the hunt. Starting from the left of New Yorker, 36 year old male from Japan. What? That was the first article. Um, this the first one I read too when I started my trip down the rabbit hole known as Bitcoin, the, the New Yorker. And, and this had the movie intrigue for me, right? How nice is it when you get into something that immediately draws you right into it? Who is this guy? He created this thing that could change the world, a whole new paradigm. The Bitcoin mints its first billionaire as the, as the cost $1,000. That was in November 2013. Researchers uncover the likely offer of the original Bitcoin paper. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but they did analysis of his white paper, and then people gave him the, the the usual suspects, give them sample writings of you know all the different people, and they run them through the computer algorithms, and they said, no, uh, no. There was one that had an over 80, I think it was over 80% chance of likelihood that they matched it, and we'll talk about that. Decoding the enigma of Satoshi Nakamoto and the birth of Bitcoin in 2015, four years, 100 million years, well, you can see. Stakes are high, the interest is high, the press is all over it, and boy, wouldn't we all like to know, is it Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto, this gentleman from Southern California? Well, Newsweek magazine traced down this gentleman and uh, issued it on their cover of their, <laughs> of their magazine and scared poor Dorian to death. He hadn't ever heard of Bitcoin before. And when the hundreds of cameras started showing up at his house, he wasn't prepared for, and he was, uh, uh, he, at that point, he thought Bitcoin was something bad or illegal, and he tried to disassociate himself from any kind of involvement with it. <laughs> a national magazine claims to have identified a mysterious founder of the worldwide digital currency called Bitcoin. Denying he is the captain said he has nothing whatsoever to do with Bitcoin. Why did you create Bitcoin? Uh, okay, we have no questions about that. Why might you know? Okay. Can you answer about Bitcoin? Why were you involved in Bitcoin? Okay, I'm not involved in Bitcoin. Who's involved in Bitcoin? Bitcoin? How about you? I'm not involved with Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is So that might have been the last time we heard from Satoshi Nakamoto, but maybe not, because by that time he let the account expire, and so somebody else could have taken that over and hacked it. And, but interesting enough, of all the other opportunities since then, that account's never ever been used again, and there's never been any other secret messages come up. So why, it doesn't make real sense to, in my mind, why this guy, who would obviously be proven innocent, <laughs> not associated with it. 
um, then he then he would come up to the defense of that guy. So some all goes to the enigma and mysteries that make the story fun. Now the interesting part of the that I found with the Dorian Nakamoto is remember the guy in the last uh, presentation that I had. So Hal Finney was the guy that who died of ALS. That we talked about him. He's the first guy that actually received Bitcoin from Satoshi Nakamoto, the first tr transaction. What was interesting is that in the whole scramble for this guy in Dorian and, and everybody else wanting to talk about anybody else that was involved with Bitcoin in the early days, they found poor old Hal by then was paralyzed and he could wink and blink, um, but it was pretty much about, it was his final days before he succumbed to Lou Gehrig's disease. And he happened by the coincidence of coincidences in the world to live only within a few blocks of Dorian Nakamoto. So the guy who had been accused for years of possibly being uh, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto and Dorian Nakamoto lived just within a few blocks of each other. So I found that interesting. Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto is probably a known genius. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Um, some other things about Hal. Uh, I wrote this in one of my articles. I wrote a farewell to him. He had himself cryogenically frozen in his final minutes. He used. He said he had Bitcoin on a CD-ROM that he had saved, put in a safe, so no one could hack a CD-ROM, right? So. He finally uh, took some of his million, by then it was worth millions of dollars, and put that, he of course had to use that for medical bills, but his final act was to go to the future, basically, try and wake up when there's a cure for this disease. So, another little bit tidbit for you. Now, how about Craig Wright and David Kleiman? This is them. <laughs> Uh, David Kleiman was involved in a motorcycle accident, so he was paralyzed for the last 10 years of his life. And he was a cop before then. He had been in the military and was a federal agent, and so they gave him a desk job, basically, because he was paralyzed. And in his desk job, he learned about encryption, and he learned how to solve crimes, and was very, very technical. And he had gotten contact and made friends with this guy named Craig Wright. And... So this is either a very convincing con, which a lot of people think, or he, they really had something to do with it. This is Craig Wright himself, very proud of himself, it looks like. <laughs> and, uh, and he passed away in 2014. Um, sort of a suicide, as he was paralyzed. He eventually um, quit. They had been taken to the hospital, and he was an alcoholic at the end. And he refused treatment at the end. He says, take me home, even though he couldn't even get around. He couldn't walk, he, he couldn't care for himself, but they abided by his wishes. And, and he died at his home alone, um, a pauper. And, you know, uh, it's kind of a sad story for that. Is it any, especially if, uh, if he really was. Now, a, a little tidbit of information. As they were talking about, they, they gave, they wanted to give an award, um, the, the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics to Satoshi Nakamoto. I don't know if you're aware of this. They, he was actually nominated for this, and uh, and eventually they, the award ceremony people said, you know, we have to know, we have to have somebody come up and uh, get this award, or we can't nominate somebody who we don't definitely know who he is, and we know he did some amazing things. And there was a post in the story about that in one of the technical magazines. People could comment at the bottom, and one of the comments people found later was from. Uh, Kleinman's dad and says, can you send me the information my son had with Bitcoin? Because I know I, I think he wrote Bitcoin. <laughs> and he was, his dad was, you know, in his 90s, and I don't think he's alive anymore, but just that tie makes you kind of go, Bloop. more mystery. My name's Craig Wright, and I'm about to demonstrate um, a signing of a message with 
the public key that is associated with um, the first transaction ever done on Bitcoin, and who does the world think did that first transaction? What's the name associated with that first transaction? The monkey is Satoshi Nakamoto. So you're going to show me that Satoshi Nakamoto <laughs> is you. Yes. Some people will believe, some people won't. And to tell you the truth, I don't really care. But you can say, hand on heart to me, I am Satoshi Nakamoto. I was the main part of it. Other people helped me. Why did you feel, though, that you had to come out? Or, and why did you feel you had to keep secret for so long? I would prefer to be secret now. I don't think I should have to be out there. There's nothing owed to the world where I have to come out and say, I am X, I am Y. I mean, no one needs to do that. It is my right not to say, I did something. If I release a paper that actually benefits people, why do I have to actually take credit for it? Why do I? Wouldn't you be proud to be known as Satoshi Nakamoto? Yeah, but that doesn't mean I have to bounce around in front of TV cameras. Uh, you could say you've invented something amazing that you want to you want to say, I am the man who invented this. I want to work. I want to keep doing what I'm doing, and that's what I'm going to do. And I don't work and invent and write papers and code by coming in front of TVs. I don't want money, I don't want fame, I don't want adoration, I just want to be left alone. I mean one of the stories that came out was that you were under investigation by the Australian tax authorities. Was that true? Or is, is, is that I have, No, I have companies that are under audit. The reason for that is we have told the ATO everything. We have told them about the tax uh, issues and implications. We actually put in everything with the auditors. We were using uh, KPMG and, and a number of tax lawyers at the time, and we had internal audit, and we supplied that to the tax office so that we could try and pay the correct amount of tax. And because no one understands Bitcoin very well, and no one understands it, uh, the timing or anything like that, then it's still an ongoing matter. So we have lawyers negotiating how much tax I owe. Because people assume that Satoshi Nakamoto must be fabulously rich. The inventor of Bitcoin must have vast stores of Bitcoin and therefore be incredibly rich. What matters isn't how much I have, it's when I use it. Because I've got an asset class that has gone up in value, doesn't mean I pay tax on it now. I pay tax when it's deployed, only on the bits that are deployed, no more. And are you planning to deploy as you put it, any of that Bitcoin? I've deployed enough and I'm happy where I am. I'm not looking for money, and this is one, one comment I want to make to people. I don't want money, I don't want help. And I'm categorically going to say this, and I'm making sure that things are being put in place with lawyers and whatever else. If anyone puts me up for awards or anything like that, I will never, ever accept a cent. Ever. If you put me for a Nobel Prize, if you put me for an ACM Turing medal, if you put me up for some honour, I will never accept a cent from any of you for anything. Why now? Why have you decided to identify yourself as Satoshi Nakamoto? I didn't decide. I had people decide this matter for me. And they're making life difficult, not for me, but my friends, my family, my staff. I have staff here in London, I have staff overseas. And they want to be private. They don't want all of this to affect them. And I don't want any of them to be impacted by this. None of it's true. There are lots of stories out there that have been made up. And I don't like it hurting those people I care about. So I'm going to do this once, and once only. I'm going to come in front of a camera once. And I will never, ever be on the camera ever again for any TV station or any media, ever. And that was ever, just in case you missed that last one. <clears throat> so, he signed a transaction, just like Gavin said, I will believe the real Satoshi. 
if he can use one of these addresses that we know we can see the public key to, you have to know the private key to be able to sign a transaction or to spend it. And we'll talk about signing transactions in another day. <clears throat> so he did. He used a, a, a Bitcoin that was mined in the first few weeks. I think it was number Bitcoin number nine from the batch, the block nine, I believe it was. And <clears throat> he was able to do it. He, was, he said, watch me. And they, they brought in a laptop right fresh from the, the store, the computer store. Made sure it had no software, nothing on, you know, so they unwrapped it. Gavin sat there, right there, and they loaded a, uh, the Bitcoin protocol off of a brand new media that they just put together. So there was no chance of funny business going on. And they put it in, and the, with the cameras rolling, they says, okay, here you go. And in front of them, he used his private key and gave it the little code or whatever, and, and it worked. And everybody was able to see it. And later on, people were like, this guy? <laughs> really? This guy's our hero? I don't know about that. And the people that are really, really, really smart about cryptography started to look at that key a little bit more, the public key and the private key they used. And people started to think, wait a second, block number nine, wasn't that the block that he sent to Hal Lane? You know, Hal Finney? We've seen that block before. Of all the Bitcoin he could have chosen to use, why would he use the only one that had been used before? And so they started backtracking the encryption that was used to cover that, and they started finding some funny business. Cryptography's kind of grown, and it changes a little bit throughout the years, and I don't know the details of it it's, uh, particularly, but the key that he used hadn't been developed until years after the Bitcoin had been given. So he was using a key that, that had, was from a generation that didn't exist at the time. They said, why? What's going on here? So seeing him, and, and you saw the subtle little things, if you put me up for a Nobel Prize or the Turing Award, you know, su suggesting these things in people's minds, I won't take a cent. No, he wouldn't take the award, but he won't take a cent. Um, a lot of things didn't add up, but a fairly convincing con. He gave uh, leaked through various sources, information, articles, letters, proofs um, through some magazines, and then try to do uh, get money from some of these organizations, news media, whatever, in the background. I don't know what I'll give an interview for X amount of dollars. Things started to fall apart on him too. But for a while there, it's a very convincing story, and he's a professor. You can you, actually he taught a class in Australia, a computer class. So he was actually a teacher, you can YouTube it, and I did. And he knows the stuff, he knows, he was trying to build a supercomputer in London, and a lot of people suspect he was, and he, right after these interviews, he put in hundreds of patents for Bitcoin-related technology, blockchain-related technology. So some of the people suspect he was doing some publicity to get loans on supercomputers, any big business thing. But the guy is uh, really smart. It turns out that the classes that he was, was teaching on that was filmed that you can see on YouTube, he was doing as a punishment for some kind of fraud. I didn't, didn't know that right at first, but they said, you're doing community service and this is your assignment. You're gonna teach encryption. So that's your YouTube, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, wild, crazy stories that we know. What about Nick Zabo? We didn't really talk about him before. With his, this is from somebody who's talking. With his modest clothes and unassuming manner, Mr. Zabo could be could be the kind of person who could have a fortune and not spend any of it. Even throw away the keys to the to that whole stash. People that know him says he drives still drives a car from the '90s. So I wrote a story about the people that were super influential in Bitcoin's early history, giving them some honor. And I knew the names of several of these people, and I, so I included their picture when I gave them their tribute. But trying to find a picture that Nick Zabu was impossible. This picture came out after I wrote that story. Um, he, he actually showed up for this conference. He's not a really well-spoken person, but he wrote an important piece of paper, or a paper that was submitted, an academic paper called Bit Gold, that was submitted, um, I think, in 99. So a good eight years before that. He actually introduced the blockchain concept of chaining things together in blocks. 
a lot of the precursors that went into Bitcoin were in BitGold. And remember when I talked about the computer algorithm and the university that says we're going to take all of these people's writings that they have, and, you, and Nick's got a blog that you can go to, so lots of evidence of his writing style. And I said, hmm, bing, this is the guy whose writing matches 80% of the, and then, and then there's, you can go to the history on Bitcoin uh, talk, uh, the, what's the, the development site for Bitcoin talk, I think it's bitcointalk.com, and you can see all the IM messages and emails are still recorded there, frozen in history of all of his communications. So there's the actual Satoshi Nakamoto's conversations are still there. You can go read his answers and inputs to questions and whatnot that people are asking him. And so, uh, so this guy is who I think is the real Satoshi Nakamoto. Here's a couple little clips on him. My compatriot Michael Casey is here. Uh, with all the details on this story. Well. Yeah, Nick Zabo is the name that has come up. Nick Zabo, who is he? Well, we're trying to figure it out. He, he's, he's not the first time that he's been named as a right. possible creator. He's a blogger. Pretty well known in the circle. Right. He's a blogger in the circle. circle. Big gold. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been yeah, very much involved in you know, developing ideas around some of the core uh, theories behind Bitcoin, right. decentralized uh, organizations, uh, cryptocurrencies. He, he invented something called Big Gold uh, not that long ago. <laughs> before before Bitcoin. Before Bitcoin. Right, exactly. Right. So um, that's that's always put him on people's radar screens. And now this university, Aspen University in the UK, has done some forensic linguistic study mm -hmm. of his writings and concluded that it's an uncanny similarity between his writings and the white paper that the supposedly pseudonymous uh, Satoshi Nakamoto produced in 2008. Right. And, and that page you see right there, that is uh, Nick Zabo's, that's his, his website, that's his homepage. And what the university did was they, they looked at sort of the 11 most likely people, people that are often named right. as Satoshi, compared them all, and said, oh, those guys, right. Right. Zabo is the most So, yeah, likely. It's, not, it's not a universe of all the possible creators. Right. The people that, that, that often get named as, as possibilities may include people like Gavin Andreessen from Bitcoin mm -hmm. Foundation uh, and, and a few of these other. Hal Finney, Hal Finney Dustin Trammell. Exactly. Figures who have been very active in the, in the cryptocurrency world. Um, but, you know, this guy's an interesting fella. He, yeah. he, uh, he's got a very eclectic set, set of writings. He writes about uh, deep, deep sea oil uh, mining. He, he, he writes about uh, the uh, invention of printing presses in mm -hmm. civilization. It's a, it's a very kind of broad, eclectic set of uh, writings. And, you know, it, it, it's possible. I mean, we just we know from what happened with the, uh, the Newsweek uh, story and, and all the doubt that's been so right. about that. This is, a, this is a risky game, you know, putting right. your finger on the call. And, and the university, they don't come out and say, this is definitely the guy. They say, look, based on what we've done, we think he is the most likely. Mm -hmm. It's worth looking into. Right. Um, <laughs> where does this go next? To him, right? I mean, is that yeah. ultimately it? Does he come back and sort of refute it or, or confirm it? Does he say anything? And, uh, you know, this, as I say, it's not the first time this has been named as a trigger. So, there you have it. Uh, some suspicion that agrees with me that that might be the guy. And as I went a little bit further, we see the references on the Bitcoin white paper. This was written as an academic paper. And we see the, the previous work that went into this. Bitcoin didn't just zap into existence from nothing. So here's some of the references that it built on. Um, w Day, wow, well, how do you even say Day? Um, I, there's no pictures of Day out there anywhere. Um, this, these guys like to remain very anonymous. And I still can't find a picture of Day. And uh, he created something called Bee Money. Now, if you look at all the people on there, we talked about. You know, I had pictures of these in, the, in our, you know, last week. Um, hash cash, Adam back. You know, the one name that's not there, suspiciously, you don't see Nick Zabo's name there. The guy who invented Big Gold, the guy who had the, all these other ideas that were built upon before Bitcoin. Hmm, that makes you wonder, doesn't it? If I'm Satoshi, I might feel a little embarrassed about including myself as a reference. This last interview. And the general feeling was that he was Nick Shabo, right? That was certainly as the year went on and I had these conversations, the, the most 
frequent candidates that people brought up is, as you said, Gabo, who's um, been at this for two decades. Mm -hmm. He, before Bitcoin was ever around, he created this thing called BitGold. Um, he's a guy I met in the course of reporting this. He, he doesn't he doesn't go out much. He doesn't appear much, and so there are a lot of things that point to him that are consistent with him being uh, Satoshi. And I think perhaps the most interesting thing I learned in in, in uh, researching his background and the background of Bitcoin is that he was part of this group of people uh, that were trying to build something like Bitcoin for a long time. And a lot of the stories that have claimed to identify Satoshi have sort of started from this notion that it could be anybody, you know, that it, it, this was this was this this sort of this almost supernatural creation. Okay. And, and the reality is, when you look at the history of this, it was a lot of people doing a lot of work over a lot of years, and you had to know about all of that work because a lot of those pieces went into Bitcoin. And so that kind of narrows down the pool of people who it could be um, because it, it has to be somebody who knew about cash cash from 1998, who knew about David Chalmers' digital signatures, and who knew about all these things that were really limited to a small group of people. But, um, you know, I, I think my ultimate conclusion on, on, on Sabo is that he certainly contributed to Bitcoin. He was part of this group of people who, without whom Bitcoin wouldn't have been possible. So, sorry, we had a little bit of a freeze up of the, the video portion of that. So, yeah, he brought up, uh, the, the gentleman doing the interview there was uh, Nathaniel Popper, and he's the one that I mentioned, wrote the, the book, uh, Digital Gold, which I, which I highly recommend, very good. He, he's a very good writer. And if you look through the New York Times and you do your research on uh, what he's written in the past, he's been following Bitcoin probably longer than anybody. So he knows this stuff. He's tried to stay, uh, he tries to stay neutral about it, but he, you know, it's going to be hard going and meeting these people and going to the conferences and going all over the world and watching this thing grow and uh, you know become a movement and not be a little bit jaded or or uh, take away some some of your neutrality about it. So, where does that leave us? Anybody have a, an opinion about who it is? By the raise of hands, who thinks it's Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto? Anybody? No, no. Hal Finney, possibly? Possibly. Um, Craig Wright? Really? Anybody? Craig Wright? <laughs> Convincing Khan, if it wasn't really him. Or Dave Klein. Or, or Dave Klein. They say the um, the writings that they uncovered, uh, they worked really closely together. They said Dave Klein might have been, if that was them, the brains of it, and Craig Wright, some of the organization, whatever, it could have been a dual thing there. I think that's what he was trying to lead people to believe. And that he, in that story, um, that the Bitcoins were held on a CD-ROM or, or a USB flash drive that David knew about. And then when he died unexpectedly, of course he lived in America and Craig lived in Australia and something went wrong and he wasn't aware. And then I understand that he took an emergency trip to David's parents' house looking for some mysterious USB key that could be holding you know, the keys, the private keys to access you know, a, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So wouldn't that be funny and ironic if it was sitting laying on somebody's USB key sitting in some grandma's home in a drawer or whatever. And, uh, and he, Perhaps if Craig Wright is, he just is frustrated. He can't get to those coins. He knows his encryption. He knows his stuff. He's aware that he has the talents and skills and computer and to do it. Craig Wright and this other guy. So, hmm, there's still that little light of possibility, even though he tried to prove it with something that he may not have just had access to the the ones that were sitting on a USB drive. And maybe he was as involved. And we don't want to think so because he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> we, got, we like our heroes to be, you know, riding white horses. And even if he was, you know, let's just pretend it's not him. You know, we don't want that guy. Knowing who Satoshi is will make no difference to how Bitcoin operates now. It's based on open source programming. It's been taken over, over they said over 70, 80% of it's been completely rewritten. He's not involved, hasn't been. 
And I watched a great interview with a, with a speaker who says, do we know who uh, did some of our advanced math? Or is it some of the geography or the uh, geometry, the Ecclesiastes geometry? Thousand, you kids, right? How many thousands of years ago? We don't know if it was a man or a woman or an alien or whatever, but the math still works. It doesn't matter anymore. So knowing his, his identity is being compared with no one else. Got it right there. <laughs> the mysterious creation story does give us an air of suspense about what the possibility is of when where they're at, the million of Bitcoins, what they'll be worth one day. And not knowing who he is is kind of the fun. It doesn't really matter, but it doesn't stop us from wondering. And we get this kind of cool creation story of this money and this mystery that that's kind of uh, as fun as having money and knowing the paradigm changes it's going to bring. So, <laughs> back to the usual suspects. Anybody think it's Nick? Nick Zabo? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of evidence. That's who I think it is, too. And he's, a, and he's the, the guy on the end. He's a good guy, uh, from what I can tell. And I've read a lot of his blog. The guy knows the stuff. He, he was a professor. They're all pretty, well, the, the people who are really involved. Uh, professors and he he knows his economics uh, his I mean he's like I said his eclectic writings he he taught I think finance as well the only thing was he wasn't a coder that's what it said is like Bitcoin was written in C++ and well Nick doesn't know how to code at all so how did that work but Nick um, they found some writings in 2007 about the time that Satoshi says he started working on it he found some blog posts with some people he's talking about. And he had this great theory. He's still talking about big gold. And then he's asked, and I'm like, hey, does anybody want to help me code that up? And then I was the last. And so some people say, well, Hal Finney was a coder. So they said, you know, there's some people that says that it could have been Hal writing it, the actual code for it, and Nick writing the paper and doing the academic stuff. And uh, they asked, well, Nick, what were you doing during 2008 to 2009? And uh, Nick says, well, uh, work on something else. Well, what? Well, it was just something else. That's about as deep into it as he goes, and he's denied it the whole time. Thank you very much for asking, he says, but no, it's not me. So that's sort of the end of this presentation, except I have one more. This picture. And let me see if we have the guy who solved this on 